Dr. Ponsky is one of the most uh, highly renowned surgeons in the, in the country and the world for that matter. Um, he's currently a professor of surgery at Case Western and holds the Linda and Marilyn Yonker Chair in Developmental Endoscopy at Case Western and then is a, also has a dual appointment at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, this is where he's from, this is Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, favorite place for Dr. Philippi's Indi Cleveland Indians. Uh, what am I calling them? Guardians. Guardians, yeah. Um, uh, it's um, located right on, the, on Lake Erie, uh, and uh, both Cleveland Clinic and Case Western are there. Um, I kind of admire uh, Dr. Ponsky's uh, uh, training because it, 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 a lot of it mirrors mine. A lot of people have asked me many times why I haven't gone anywhere. Why have I been to Creighton since my whole career? Well, he's he's the same way. He's had all of his education and everything in Cleveland, so I'm I'm impressed by that. Uh, he went to Miami University of Ohio for his undergraduate, then went to medical school at Case Western, uh, then went on and did his residency and internship there. In the meantime, uh, did some service in the military while he was in his residency. Um, he then joined the faculty at, K at Case Western uh, uh, from 1976 to 1997, and there was the director of the Department of Surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital, which is a, a teaching hospital for the for uh, Case Western. Uh, he was associate dean for alumni affairs, vice chairman of the department, and uh, while he was doing that, he obtained a, uh, an, an MBA in 1990. Um, he then switched. He then. Uh, jumped ship and went over to the Cleveland Clinic across town and where he was program director for the general surgery residency. He was executive director of the Minimally Invasive Surgery Center, uh, director of graduate medical education and uh, vice chairman of the Division of Education. Um, um, in 2005 to 2014, uh, Oliver H. Payne, professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery, serves in chief at the University Hospitals and then uh, at an uh, endowed chair was established in his name in 2009 and funded. Um, so then from 2014 on to, to the present time, he's uh, sort of has had his feet in both institutions. Uh, he does foregut surgery and uh, advanced surgical endoscopy at Cleveland Clinic and he's an emeritus professor at Case Western. Uh, scholarly activity, uh, um, over 250 original articles in his CV, 82 textbooks, and book chapters. And as I told the residents this morning, uh, I, I'm not smart enough to count high enough to count up his national and international presentations because it's 48 pages long. Uh, and then his language. Uh, among many, many leadership roles that he's had, that he's had uh, I just picked out some of the most important ones uh, because there's many others in his CV, but he was, he's been a former chairman of the American Board of Surgery, former president of, the, of SAGES, uh, Vice President of the American Surgical Association, the most prestigious surgical society in the country and in the world, uh, and then Vice President of the SSA too. Uh, some prestigious awards that he's um, he's uh, encountered: um, Kaiser Teaching Excellence Awards at Case Western, Sage's Distinguished Service Award, uh, the uh, Sage's Rudolf Schindler Award, and the Sage's Pioneer and and, and endoscopy award and finally he received the George Bercy lifetime achievement. Oops. So um, perhaps the most what he's most noted for is for inventing the peg tube procedure which is now used so all over the world routinely. Uh, so um, with that that was your talk this morning but with that I'll turn the uh, podium over to you. Let's see if we can get to my talk here. Um, is Chaz here? You know how to do that? Okay. Metamorphosis is right, right there. Let's go to the thing that says talk. Yeah, there it is. Thanks, Jess. Well, I'm going to move around a little bit because I hate podiums. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'll put this farther away. 
it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this talk is not technical. This talk is philosophical. And uh, after you do 50 years of surgery, um, do I need this for the Zoom people? Can we turn it down? Anyhow, after you do 50 years of surgery, you start to look back on what you do, what you've done, and suddenly you realize that nothing you do today, almost nothing, is what you did in your residency. Isn't that discouraging, folks? What you're doing today, you look back on and go, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. So let's look, let's look back at this. Have nothing to this is called surgical metamorphosis. And the metamorphosis, you all know what that is. It's the change of something that's a mature form of something over time into another mature form of something, okay? And like the caterpillar into the butterfly. This is surgery in 1889. Theodore Billroth, some of you may have heard of this guy. Theodore Billroth's in Vienna and he's teaching surgery. You can see how they're working to anesthetize the patient. But these are the students. They're dressed just as you are. You see that? With ties and jackets and shirt coats. They were very fancy. They didn't come to work in sweatshirts, guys. And they're straining to see what Bill Ross is doing because that's the theater, the operating room theater. And this isn't just a conceptualization. This is one of these theaters exists in many of the old hospitals today. At Mass General, the Ether Dome, at Cincinnati, they have this, and they're magnificent to see where everything circles around the center. That's how they taught in 1889. That was the state of the art. And they were extremely pleased to have an auditorium like that. Well, now, and that's Dr. Rosen, now nobody looks at the patient anymore. Oh, is the patient in the room? That's nice. Everybody's looking at a screen somewhere. Their hands are over here, maybe, or they're sitting down at a console, but they're, they're, not, touch, they're not looking inside the patient most of the time. They're, they're looking at screens. So the paradigm has shifted. This is 1972. This is the day, my last day of internship. And you can see I'm circled back there I had a little bit of hair back then, a lot of hair. And I was ready now after finishing a grueling 36 on 12 off internship to partake of the next four years, 36 on and 12 off, that's changed, where we would do learn the principles of surgery. And then after those four years, I'm here very happy and sophisticated looking with my group of fellow residents in my graduation picture. And I was hired to be on the staff at the university in Cleveland. And I was prepared to teach. I wanted to teach so badly the principles of surgery. And I remember the day when I was standing in front of the blackboard at our m, &M conference and the students were there and I was writing on the blackboard. This is, these are the principles that you have to know for surgery. My back was to the audience. And this was Eminem. So one of my colleagues, son of a gun, he said, there are no principles. Why did I just spend the last five years learning the principles when there are no principles? But you know what? In a way, he was right. Why are things changing? Not just in surgery. I'm using surgery as an example. But in everything we do, things are changing. Epidemiology of diseases is changing. We talked about it this morning. We showed and talked about a gastric cancer. Gastric cancer used to be something you saw all the time. And you don't see it very much anymore in this country. It's interesting. The epidemiology changes. And we'll get to some other examples. We see new technology. Our concept of what causes and is a disease changes. And there is enhanced medical therapy. This is me in 1970s doing abdominal surgery. This is unbelievable, abdominal surgery. I have a friend, he's retired now. He was a pediatric surgeon, Marty Eichelberger. He went to the Navy and he was working in the Navy for the Berry plan, two years he had to take off. And he was coming back, he was thinking about going into orthopedics. 
And I said to him, Marty, do you remember the feeling of having your hand in the pelvis up to the elbow and going behind the rectum and the sacrum and lifting it up and hearing that sucking sound? Do you remember that? He said, I'm going into general surgery. <laughs> that was what surgery was like then. You don't have your hand in that much anymore. Of course, some of the stuff you're doing now, again, you do. But for a large part of what we do, it's not like that anymore. And then later on in the 80s, we got more sophisticated. We in trauma. We knew what a medial visceral rotation meant to get to the pancreas, to get to the big vessels and how to rotate the viscera. We learned more sophisticated open surgery. And then in 1990, everything stopped. It's like the train wheels stopped. You could hear the screech because all of a sudden I was holding on to a trocar for dear life, praying it didn't move. Two hands on the trocar. Remember about working with one hand, digging out the gallbladder while somebody else held the gallbladder up. Later, we learned to work with two hands, but this was how laparoscopic surgery with a little television on a rolling stand and the insufflator over here, the world changed because the technology changed. Somebody thought about putting the video camera on the end of a scope so we could see. Technology changed, changed the world. And some people, and Bob knows this guy, Jacques Parasat, who did one of the first lab coles in Paris and France. He's actually from Bordeaux. He said, this is a revolution. And it seemed like a revolution. It was in many ways a revolution. But other people said, no, no, step back. This is just the evolution of technology and surgery and thought. And so it wasn't necessarily revolution, but evolution. And so as this went on, and Chris, you and I talked about this yesterday. Oh, I want to do minimally invasive surgery. Oh, yeah? Well, there's no such thing anymore as one specialty that does minimally invasive surgery. Because in the beginning, it was all general surgery. Gallbladder, bile duct, bile, the bowels, the colidocal cysts, the hernias. And we had only so many cockamamie ways to fix hernias, Bob. You and I remember rolling up a piece of a proline, putting it in the hole. Eye palms, you know, the tips and the taps and all sorts of stuff that we'll talk about. And then laparoscopic foregut surgery. And I was just in your in um, Chuck Philippi's old office, and I saw a picture uh, of that, of your group that was here, and Ron Hinder and Chuck Philippi, and it was it, those were the golden days of foregut surgery. We started to learn about doing misses, and we started doing parasophageal hernias. The world was opening us to us doing laparoscopic surgery, and then they started take, building a ship in the bottle. How do you take out a spleen through an incision that says an inch long? We did, we figured it out. How do you take out a pancreas? How do you do uh, you know, the liver resections? Everything was done in that. We thought we owned the world, and all of a sudden these slugs around us started to steal it again. Can you believe it? The urologists, the GYN doctors, Neurosurgeon and the heart surgeon started to get into this. They're the klutzes with endoscopic surgery, but they did it. And then we look toward the future now. And what will the future of our surgery be? It will be image guided, and we're starting to see that already. We talked about endoluminal surgery with a scope. We talked about intramural surgery this morning, making a tunnel in the wall transluminal and even robotic, yes. So here was a picture from one of my atlases in the 1980s showing me doing an upper endoscopy. And most of you saying, so what? Except if you look at the picture, you'll see I'm looking through the scope. My eye is to the eyepiece. This was before we had video endoscopy. This is pure fiber optic endoscopy. Now you don't do this anymore. You look at a big screen. And you see, and it's magnified, and you can see everything. So this is how we used to do it. And what about that endoluminal therapy? I spent my whole career doing that. We did, as I talked about before, we took out polyps. We divided the sphincter of OD. We did sclerotherapy for varices, and we did banding. We stented the bile duct. And I'll show you many of these things and where they've gone. Well, let's talk about the esophagus. First of all, reflux. When I started doing endoscopy in 1975, 
I started doing children because the pediatric surgeon there, Bob Isant, was my great defender. People didn't want to let me do it. He said, do my patients. This is a 15-year-old kid with reflux. Now, in, that's bad esophagitis. You can see that. We said, why didn't you treat it? What did we have to treat it with then? We didn't have H2 blockers, and we didn't have PPIs. You know, we had a few dietary changes in that Nalox. So this was back then in the day. And you know how that healed? That healed with a stricture like that. And what could we do for strictures? Well, that would require metal bougies and stuff until we divided balloon dilators for the scope that we could dilate them with. And what about this, a lie stricture? This is a horrible long stricture, often requiring esophageal resection. We learned to put in expand, these are one of the early expandable metal, uh, plastic stents, removable. And we could put these in and we could take them out when we wanted and we got resolution of the stricture without surgery. That was a major advance with endoscopy. These, for those of you who've never seen it, anybody know what these are? These are esophageal varices. Looks like a string of pearls underneath a silk blanket, if you like. You see the string of pearls there? Those are varices, and they can bleed. And when they bleed, you want to run away because it bleeds fast and furious. So we used to get a football helmet. We used to get a big tube called a Sengstock and Blakemore tube and attach it here under pressure. And later on, we would go in and we would do a port cable shunt. And people made their whole careers doing port cable shunts and telling us how to do a port cable shunt. Of course, port cable shunts put uh, some um, uh, loss of cognitive function, hepatic encephalopathy. And that was too much. Actually, we didn't have insulin going to the, from the pancreas going to the, to the brain. We found out that later is called, a, what was it called? Some factor. Uh, but it was insulin, the, the factor that was not going to the brain. So they decided to make a smaller shunt and they tried a, a splenorenal shunt. The trouble with a splenorenal shunt, you got less hepatic encephalopathy, but they clogged up real fast. And so a bright guy from Atlanta named Dean Warren, a little surgical history, Dean Warren said, look, we are going to keep the blood flow going to the liver, but we're gonna disconnect all the varices. We're gonna disconnect all the varices and put them with the splenic vein into the renal vein. And that was called a selective shunt or a distal splenorenal shunt. Cool shunt, I learned how to do it just when I finished residency. I was all set. I did a few of these and guess what happened? Greg Van Stigman, working over a surgeon, working over in the colorectal department, putting rubber bands on hemorrhoids said in Colorado, said, why can't I put those same rubber bands on esophageal varices and get rid of the varices We don't need to do any shunts? That's what you do today. Varices are treated this way now, without all the hoopla, without all the bleeding, without all the tubes, you put rubber bands on them, kiss them goodbye, right? And if they keep having a lot of hypertension, guess what you do? You call the radiologist and you say, put a tips in this patient. Transjugular intrahepatic porticable shunt, boom, done. So all of a sudden, all of those fancy shunts that we learned, all of that magnificent Dean Warren surgery, it's history, history. This is a squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Now, when I see this in the endoscopy suite, I stop. I run to the next room. I say to everybody, come look at this. This is a squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. You don't see this anymore. It used to be when I was beginning training, all we saw. You didn't see adenocarcinoma. You saw this, squamous cell carcinoma. However, over the last number of decades, squamous cells have been going away and adenos going up because of reflux and injury and Barrett's esophagus. So the epidemiology of this disease has changed and it has changed what we can do for this disease. So here's an adeno, here's Barrett's esophagus and there's an adeno occurring in Barrett's esophagus. And here's Barrett's esophagus. It's a metaplasia, the change of one adult mature type of epithelium squamous to another adult mature type of epithelium columnar. 
with goblet cells in it. And that's Barrett's esophagus. And right away, we have to biopsy it every two years. And it's due to injury by the reflux. And our ideas about this have changed too. What we do is we biopsy that esophagus, that Barrett's. And I talked about this plasia. That's what we're looking for, a change in the types of cells. It's like a pap test. If it shows abnormal cells, we start our intensive treatment even more, more antacids, et cetera. But when it gets to high-grade dysplasia, a fire bell is going off. Tom DeMeester, who used to be here, said if you took out the esophagus on patients who had high-grade dysplasia, a lot of them would have intramural mucosal carcinomas. And he recommended taking out the esophagus on anybody who developed high-grade dysplasia. But something else happened. We learned to do endoscopic surgery. We learned two things. Number one, with a cap on the scope, we can excise the area of dysplasia, of the worrisome high-grade dysplasia. And then we can burn the esophagus with a, a probe that goes down, has a balloon that blows up, and we cook at 360 degrees, and squamous mucosa, the normal stuff, grows back. This was developed by a surgeon, David Utley, who was from California, who's an ENT surgeon, brilliant guy. He commercialized this stuff. I don't know if he made any money, but he's a wonderfully brilliant guy. He did Strata too, by the way. And this has changed the way we manage Barrett's esophagus now, because very few patients with Barrett's esophagus have to get an esophagectomy now. We can manage them with this Barrex device. It's an outpatient procedure. Now, what if they do get an invasive carcinoma of the esophagus? What if they do need an esophagectomy? Well, esophagectomy used to mean a big incision in your abdomen, a big incision in your chest, and maybe an incision in your neck, at least the first two. And it was pretty morbid operation. There's an esophagectomy patient. But now, we do esophagectomy laparoscopically and thoracoscopically, and oh yes, even robotically. And these patients have minimally invasive operations and do quite well. So we've reduced the morbidity through enhancements in technology. This is achalasia. I talked about it this morning. The failure of the sphincter to relax. We've learned that there are many ways medically to treat it, but they don't work. However, we know that Heller, this is that balloon I talked about, which dilates it. But the Heller myotomy is the gold standard, and that's laparoscopic, where we go in and we open up the muscle. There's also the peroral endoscopic myotomy. So this is a video of how we do the Heller myotomy. And Bob, you know this is beautiful, right? Look at this. This is just, what you, why, why would you ever improve on something like that? This is great. You see, we're dividing both layers of the muscle, leaving the mucosa intact. But now in the era, in the era of intramural surgery, we have other options. And what we can do is go in with the scope and we can make a tunnel, as we talked about before. We can see the muscle, cut the muscle through the mouth without ever having to make any incisions, either open or laparoscopic, and then just clip it closed and get the same result. And here you see us endoscopically in the esophagus, and you can very clearly see the muscle fibers, and we can divide them. We can divide them. This is intramural surgery endoscopically, all for the benefit of the patient. Now, what about surgery on the stomach? Let's look at what we have here. This is what I used to walk into the emergency room and see several times a week. Bad bleeding, bad bleeding. And in the early days of endoscopy, here's what that would do. We would walk in, we'd wash out the stomach, we'd scope the patient, and we'd say, there's a bleeder, go get him. <laughs> That's all we did, go get him to the surgeon, because we had nothing to do endoscopically. We would just say, it's in the duodenum, it's in the stomach, here it is, go get it. And the surgeon was grateful for that because it did localize it, but we couldn't do much. And then some people around the country, a lot of them surgeons, Walter Gaysford, for example, and others, 
started saying, well, what if we take a, something like a bovi, an electrical wire, and start to buzz those bleeders? Surgeons weren't afraid to buzz them. They buzz stuff all the time, right? Sub-Q, everywhere we go, we buzz. And so they started it with monopolar wires, and it worked. It worked. So we had electrocoagulation, and here's an actively bleeding ulcer. Can you imagine just seeing that and saying, okay, bye? Uh, that's what we used to do. And then all of a sudden, people said, you know what? I'm going to touch this with an electrical wire. It stopped. And then we use heater probes. And we have other things to do. And we learn to inject. OK, but if that didn't work, the surgeon had to operate. Fair enough. What did they do? We had science. We had science. Peptic ulcer disease was caused by acid, right? And we knew that there were three phases of digestion. And the first operation that we developed, vagotomy and pyloroplasty, was going to get rid of the cephalic phase, the vagus nerve, by cutting it. But we had to do a drainage procedure, like a pyloroplasty, because the stomach was paralyzed after we cut the nerves. And this operation in the, in the 50s and 60s, and even in the 70s, was very popular. Py vagotomy and pyloroplasty. And it was based on getting rid of the vagal nerve stimulation of the stomach, getting rid of the acid. But sometimes it wasn't enough. Sometimes we still had acid. We wanted a better operation. So we used our heads. We said, you know what? The vagus nerve stimulates acid in the upper stomach, but the parietal cells don't exist in the antrum. In the antrum, we have a different thing going on. In the antrum, we have the G cells making gastrin. So if we take out the antrum, and we did so-called, as we talked about, a Bill Roth one, the antrectomy, or Bill Roth two. We did those operations because we combined it with vagotomy. And the vagotomy got rid of the cephalic phase, and the antrectomy got rid of the gastric phase. And we thought we were doing a really good job. And this worked. It really worked. They were morbid in some ways, but it worked in preventing ulcer disease. We thought we had it all. But they, these operations produce some things called dumping where the patient got severe diarrhea and abdominal cramps, and we wanted to do better. And so somebody very smart said, you know what? What if we preserve the vagus nerve to the antrum, where the where gastric pump is to empty the stomach, but we cut all the vagus nerves up higher where the parietal cells are that make acid, and we won't have to do any incision on the stomach at all, and we'll get rid of the diarrhea and the cramping and everything. This was really science. This was a wonderful, this was a, called the highly selective vagotomy. I mean, we studied this operation. Ron Hinder and other, we really studied this, like Sawyers, we studied this operation. This was so great. I used to love to do that. You could do it laparoscopically, very precisely. And then something happened in the 1980s. It just screwed us to death. What happened? Some gastroenterologist discovers this bug called H. pylori. But what the hell did you just do to me? You got rid of my life. Because we discovered that most ulcers, not all, but most ulcers are due to bacterial infection. The bacteria reduce the prostaglandin production of mucin in the stomach, which protects the stomach lining against the acid. So if we kill the bacteria, the stomach can protect itself. All of a sudden, we're not doing stomach surgery anymore. We got to figure out what else to do. The, what we found out is a changing concept of disease, didn't we? Our concept of what caused ulcers changed. It wasn't the acid. It was the mucosal uh, barrier influenced by H. pylori. Huge change. How about the bleeding? Now, we don't care. Let it bleed. Come on. Dare you. We put clips on it. We can inject it with epinephrine. Now I go on to another subject. This picture is from my career in about 1983 or 4, when I was doing a huge amount of bariatric, the wrong operation, but there it was, bariatric surgery. And bariatric surgery is still a big deal. Concept of disease. We learned this from an operation almost by accident that was designed to lower cholesterol. Varco and Buckwald, they were in Minnesota. They were doing these bypasses 
originally to get rid of lower cholesterol, which it did, but the patients lost weight. And that led to this operation, which was called the jejunal ileal bypass, which I did in my residency. 14 inches of jejunum sewed to four inches of ileum. And those patients went to the bathroom all day long. And they had liver failure, and they had gallstones, and they had kidney stones, and they had seizures, but they lost weight. So that operation was called a malabsorptive operation. It was not going to be good enough to go on. And then I started doing my favorite operation, which was a restrictive operation called the vertical banded gastroplasty. And the idea was we made a hole in the stomach with the circular staple, which we had then. We stapled up to the top and we put a, a proline band, Marlex, around here. And we had a tiny little pouch, restrictive. And guess what? It worked. However, over years, that pouch, because its muscle just stretched out, these patients got horrible reflux, and we had to reverse almost all of these. So it didn't work for long. But that led to this operation, which is still around today, and I like to think of as the gold standard. It combines a restrictive component and a malabsorptive component, and that's the Ruan Y gastric bypass, which is still used today. And then we went to the gastric sleeve almost by accident because it was first stage for morbidly obese for the super obese patients, but it works quite nicely. And then people say, wait, why do I have to do that? If it's just malabsorptive, I put in this long condom into the duodenum and guess what? Maybe I get malabsorption without an operation. So that's what's being worked on today. Nissen fundal application which is an anti-reflux operation. It works, it's the gold standard, but this operation, which I talked about a little bit before, called the, uh, the uh, TIF procedure and transoral incisionless fundoplication is a device which goes up and makes a little nipple valve over here. And I thought that's nonsense. I trained in it three times. We couldn't get insurance to pay for it then, but it's been studied for a long time. And the long-term data of this tempo trial seem to show that it works. And so it's still being used today in some patients without a big hiatal hernia. Gastrostomy, we used to do it open. And we talked about it earlier, we now do a PEG procedure, which is just a simple poke in the belly and we avoid an operation. So we moved down the GI tract. We talked about the stomach not emptying, gastroparesis, what can we do? we can go in there and make a little tunnel and actually cut the muscle through the endoscope again without an operation, and in many cases make that better. But how? let's switch gears a little bit. Let's look at the biliary tree, because that's where this minimally invasive stuff started. I got this out of one of my colleagues in the doctor's locker room. He pulled off his shirt and I saw a scar. I said, I wanna get my camera and take a picture of your scar because nobody will believe we used to make that scar to take out gallbladders routinely. And now we do little puncture holes like that and send people home right away. But we have had changing concepts of disease and I wanna show you what I mean. When I was a resident doing gallbladder surgery, we were taught, this is the cystic duct and this is the cystic artery and this is the common duct, beautifully dissected. We were taught to put on our tie as close down here at the common duct as we could. So otherwise they would get a neuroma or, or, or cystic duct syndrome. So we were taught, put the tie down here. Now that we do laparoscopic surgery, oh no. We don't want to injure the common duct. We put the tie up as high as we can, right? Stay away from that common duct. So our concept of what to do has changed. But all you folks who think you're gonna be taking out gallbladders forever, better hold on to your wallet because here's what the gastroenterologist said. This patient's got gallbladder disease. They're putting in a scope through the mouth, and this scope is called endoscopic ultrasound, and they can see the gallbladder here, and they poke it with a needle, put in dye, and then through the, the connection, you can see the gallbladder, they put in a big wire. And over that wire, they put in something that looks like a finger trap, a stent that expands. Why would they do that? Because this is it. Here is the stent. We go through that and you can put a scope. This is in the stomach end of it. And you see they're taking out all the stones from the gallbladder. 
and putting them into the intestine so they pass in the poop. Okay? So at the end of this, here was the gallbladder before, and here's the gallbladder at the end. There are no more stones. So this patient doesn't need an operation. This patient has a permanent fistula. Now, is this good for every patient? No. Is it good for some patients who have bad hearts, can't have operations? Yes. And so it's being used today. And this is endoscopic ultrasound, the technology that permits that. And I'll show that again. This is a patient who has an operative angiogram, and it shows stones going down here. Okay. Now we can take them out with the coidocoscope, or we can do ERCP and take them out. You're all familiar with that, and the patient goes home right away. Sometimes we, I showed this at a meeting at Duke in 1994, and some very important people said, oh, this is, needs surgery. I said, well, maybe not. You see, this is a stricture. This patient has an injury to the common duct. Probably they dissected it too much or with thermal therapy. And so what we did is we dilated it with a balloon. And then we put in some stents, these little plastic stents. The more you put in, the better. And after a year, take out the stents. And this it's a normal common duct. And this has been shown 80% effective that you don't always have to operate on biliary strictures. How about cancer? When the patient had a cancer like this, this is a pancreatic cancer, and we did an x-ray and it shows the duct that's totally obstructed. We used to have to operate. And the operation that uh, Bob and I learned was a double bypass. You had to do a gastroenterostomy and a colidoco enterostomy to bypass the patient. These days, we just go in, and this is not one of the operations we did. It was sort of cool with all the strings hanging. It was sort of cool. That's a, a colidoco enterostomy. But these days we put in a metal stent. We can put one in the stomach to empty it. Here's the pancreatic duct obstructed. We put this in the bile duct, the patient goes home right away and they live for the rest of their life without any operation. And that's a blessing for these patients. The pancreas is something we're taught never to mess with. Here's a big pseudocyst of the pancreas. Those are sort of fun. We go in, puncture them and drain them, drain the fluid out of them and the patients don't have to have any surgery at all. Now, we used to think that this disease, pancreatic necrosis, which is this huge collection of foul infected material uh, next to the pancreas with severe pancreatitis, you don't wanna operate on these people if you don't have to. We can puncture the stomach now with a stent, a big metal stent, and it's called an axios, and drain this out again without surgery. Appendicitis, that's something we do. You do it every day, right? You see that? Well, we can do it laparoscopically and sometimes you have to work hard to dig it out. These two guys, Reddy and Rao in India, did it through the mouth with notes procedure. I'm not saying it's ready for prime time, but it's something that people are thinking about. Here it is, they're going through the wall of the stomach and taking out the appendix. It can be done. Well, we get to the colon. Let's look at the colon. This was a picture I took in 1975 after I'd finished my endoscopic training. Actually, it was 1974. I'd finished my endoscopic training and the surgeon got a little mad that I broke scrub to take this picture. It's a polyp on the stalk. It was a simple benign polyp and we operated on it. And that was in the early days of colonoscopy. And I told them that would not be the way we would do it in the future because this is the way we do it. And we talked this morning we were taught principles of surgery. And the principle I mentioned was that if a patient has an obstruction of the left colon or they have a perforation of the left colon with feces and, and pus and everything, you were not to go in there and resect it and put the two ends together. You always did a colostomy because it was an infected area. That was the rule. If you didn't say that on your board, you failed. Now you have literature to support that it can be done. You can put it back together primarily if it has a good blood supply. I don't like that, but that's the way it looks in the literature now. So keep your eyes on the literature. People are looking at that now. This hurts me, this picture. In the early part of my career in the 1980s, I used to do a lot of colon and rectal surgery. And the young people like this would come to me and they'd have ulcerative colitis and they'd have a lot of bleeding 
and pain, and it was involving their entire colon. And the rule was, after 10 years of ulcerative colitis with a lot of symptoms, you took out the entire colon and rectum, and you did an ileostomy. That was the operation you had to do. And I talked young people like this woman into having that operation because it was the correct thing to do. Guess what? Somebody had a brain, not me. And they said, you know, ulcerative colitis is a mucosal disease. It doesn't involve the whole wall. You can take out the entire colon and just strip the mucosa from the rectum and then bring a loop of ileum down and make a pouch. And they don't have to lose their anus and they don't have to have a stoma. This is called a J pouch. You guys go, of course, what are you talking about? Wasn't this always around? No, somebody used their brain and said, you know, it's a mucosal disease. Why don't we just strip that mucosa down and bring it down? What a change. How many patients I talked into the old operation? And I'll get to that in another case. Rectal cancer. We used to say, oh, Rupert Turnbull, famous rectal surgeon, if it's below 10 centimeters or six centimeters, you have to do an abdominal perineal resection. Take out the rectum. Then surgeons today started realizing we can staple lower than that. And if we take out the whole envelope called a total, total mesorectal incision containing all the lymph nodes, we get the same results without taking out the anus. Different concept of disease. This is an anal carcinoma, a squamous cell carcinoma. So how was this treated when I was a resident? With an abdominal perineal resection. You take out the anus and the colon, just what I talked about, terrible. And then somebody said, you know what? We get the same results with something called the Nigro protocol. You better know this, 5-FU, mitomycin C, and, and radiation therapy. And those patients, most of the time, do not require that tumor to be removed. It disappears. Changing therapy, changing concept of disease. Oh, now, Bobby, your stuff, hernias, OK. So this is what we learned, Bob, a McVeigh repair, right? That's when men were men, right? A McVeigh repair. The patient would cough in the recovery room. We'd go pop, 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 pop. So we made relaxing incisions like this so it was under less tension. And then with laparoscopic surgery, we were turned on our head. Wait a minute. We were turned on our head because we had a recognized internal hernia anatomy. This is a left direct inguinal hernia, guys, just so you want to know, because that's the inferior epigastric vessels, that's the vas, and there's the hernia. And we learned a million ways to fix this, and I'm not going to go into all the different hernia repairs. And then the laparoscopic hernia repairs that Bob and I lived through, that just suffice it to say that we're still learning what's best for hernias, and it changes. Now, we talked about simple umbilical hernias. Now, you see a guy in your office. This is for you. We see a guy in our office, and he has a little belly button hernia. Eh, you don't need to fix it. He said, Doc, it bothers me. It's a little ugly when I stand up, a little sore. I don't like it. Could you fix it? You say, oh, that's nothing. It's an outpatient procedure. I'll make it just a little incision around it, and I'll put four stitches, and you'll be fine. But then the guy comes back in a year, and this he's got a little bit bigger hernia. Than this. And you go, you know what? You're a little heavy. It's your fault. And you, you, you eat too much and you're too heavy. And so I'm going to fix this laparoscopically. And I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to sew it in. I'm going to put a bridge of mesh in there like that. But it comes back again. And so this time you put in a, a bigger laparoscopic piece. Okay, this is, oh, this is going to work. This is really good. Until patient comes back like this. And this is abdominal wall failure. And Michael Rosen, who is my colleague, my friend, and my student, I, he once said to me, when he went to work for me at University Hospitals, Jeff, how do you pick an area to become an expert in? I said, Mike, pick an area that no one else wants to do. Pick an area that's totally anathema to everybody else, study it, perfect it, and make it your own. I said, you can do bed sores or abdominal wall failure. He chose this. And I have to tell you, before we did this, before abdominal wall reconstruction came, which is only a decade or so old, nobody wanted these patients. 
The plastic surgeons couldn't do flaps on them. The general surgeons had multiple failures. They all had multiple failures. This started as umbilical hernia, and look what you got. And they can fix them now. And I'm not going to go into all of it, except that there's a lot of discussion about the best way to fix it. But it involves more open surgery again with, uh, with uh, uh, stopa repairs. Now, breast. I did a lot of breast in the early part of my career. Breast surgery is like a menu in a French restaurant. I mean, are you kidding? This was Halstead's operation of radical mastectomy. It was well conceived. It was based on science. You get around the tumor. You get around the lymph nodes. You take the muscle. You take everything. It can't go anymore. This is a morbid, horrible, deforming operation. And so people said, let's save the muscle. It had the same results. And so you had the modified radical mastectomy. And I remember the day when I was 1981, I was doing breast surgery because our breast surgeon had, had a stroke and I was doing his practice. And I would talk young women. You have to have a modified radical mastectomy because that's what the literature shows. We'll take the lymph nodes, da 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 da. And I would spend a lot of time, but across the street, was some crazy guy at the Cleveland Clinic named Cryle. He published his research in the New York Times. And basically he said, just take out the lump. Lumpectomy it was called. Now we call it partial mastectomy and we've gotten a whole bunch of sophisticated stuff with it. But that changed the concept. And you know what? The results are just as good with radiation as in the patients who had the modified in most cases. Depends on the case. And so here's a French menu, okay? And we keep evolving this. We would ask your people in the board of surgery questions, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna do a partial mastectomy and axillary sampling. Yes, you're gonna do sentinel node. And the sentinel node comes back uh, positive. What are you gonna do? And we expected you to say, well, I'll complete the axillary dissection. And then some son of a gun from California somewhere goes, no, we don't, we just accept that it's, you know, it's positive and we put them on a certain type of chemotherapy for that. And I went, really? I better go read the book some more myself because this stuff changes as fast as a kaleidoscope. But the point is, everything is changing because of changing concepts of disease. And this isn't done in a vacuum. It's well studied. So keep your eyes open on this. Okay, I remember I said the heart surgery and I said all those disparaging remarks about the heart surgeons. They're mostly true. Okay, <laughs> I used to love this stuff that they did because they got to work with all these marionette strings and to take the valve and lower that valve down into place. You ever see that? It's so cool, right? And it is, except now we can do it by a catheter and we put the thing on the end of a catheter and all you have to do is go and it's done. Right, but you know, so how about the abdominal aortic aneurysm? That's a big deal, except that we can do that the same way, but in a stent that way. Okay, now my favorite topic, robots. So the robot, the good thing is they have more and more arms coming out. So you can, when they're not being used, you can hang more coats on them. In any event, this is a robot, Da Vinci. And this is the kind of robot I'm looking for, which works at a distance. And we could put this through an endoscope or on the end of an endoscope in the future. And you can see that you can actually hold tissue and lift tissue and work with it. It's not as flimsy as the stuff we were using in notes. So there you are. That's a cool, and look at its suture. That thing can work. Well, what, a, what kind of robot I'm looking for? One of my grandsons is, got his master's in artificial intelligence. What I'm looking for is a robot that goes like this. You come in in the morning and you say, what's on my schedule? We have a Whipple on the schedule. And the robot's going to do it and you'll sit in the room. And so you say to the robot, please do the Whipple on this patient. And the robot looks at the x-rays and say, yes, sir. And begins the case and then says, you know, sir, there is tumor in the portal vein. What do you want me to do? And you say to the robot, well, what do you think you should do? The robot says, I think we should take the left renal vein, interpose it, and complete resect the portal vein. Okay, do the procedure and call me when you're done. 
That's the kind of robot I want and that you'll see in the future because that robot will have more intelligence than us. It will put all the literature and all the technical expertise together and will really be a robot, not a telemanipulator. And I think that that's what you ought to look as you have vision for down the road. Well, how are we gonna teach you guys these procedures as they're changing so rapidly? And the way we teach you can't be this way anymore. This is the see one, do one, teach one model. And the, the American Board of Surgery requiring a few cases like this is not the way either. We have to have a new paradigm. And of course, the old fashioned ways are good and many fellowships do help and animal models and simulation models, but these new simulators are getting better and better. And you'll be able to practice in lifelike situations more and more. And I, when I do one of these, I like to create a complication and say, fix it because you can do that and you can practice and it can grade you. Ha, ah, so open surgery is gone. Our days are gone, Bob, unless they see a case like this. Somebody does an ERCP and they say, oh boy, we got thousands of stones. This patient needs a biliary bypass and a tough one, an open one. Somebody has to know how to do that. This patient has a tight, Stricture at the port of hepatitis needs somebody pretty sophisticated to go up there and fix that. And trauma, the last bastion of open surgery, people have got to go in there and fix those blast injuries and resect that and know what they're doing. So we have to know how to sew. And one way we can do that is in a lab with an animal lab. So that's another component. You can use explants sometimes. You can do vagotomy. You can do a gastrectomy and you can do hand-sewn anastomoses or stapled anastomoses over and over again. So there are many new paradigms. We'll see them in the future, but the complete skill center will have all of these things in it so that we can use them when appropriate. And I think explants are terrific. So this was surgical training and learning 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. Now we do surgery without an incision and we don't know if anybody knows how to open. And the reason for the changes in practice are not only what I've said, they're all for the patient's benefit and they demand cosmesis, they demand it. The patient will demand what they want. Lap Coley wasn't driven by us. Patients heard about it and they demanded it. And industrial marketing is something we have to be careful about. You see it on TV every night, you can't get away from it. But not everything we knew in the past was right. This is our old buddy Hippocrates. And I went back and looked at this and said, this guy says, I will not use the knife, not even on sufferers from stones. Come on, that's half of what I did my whole career is take out stones. So he's not always right. However, we have to stay current. We have to accept and embrace new technology and new concepts of disease. And we have to train our next generation to not only do these procedures, but learn how to evolve with these procedures. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thank you. I'm sure you got thousands of I have one. That's very nice. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, and it was cheaper than a robot. <laughs> Old thing about how uh, Eskimo cats put some words to snow, right? 
we have what three words for cold cider, and everybody's familiar with the spectrum of disease. You take out soft disease, steroid disease, the flu, and all it all matters. We all know what that matters. And then you've got cure the disease with wall, and that's what we're doing. Fortunately, we all that's why you call your older partner who's seen a few. That's right. So I think one other thing that I didn't mention that's coming in the future is telementoring. And I think someday when you're off in a snowstorm like we might have tonight, and you have to be stuck in Omaha like I will be tonight, and you have to do this case and you haven't seen that before, you will get on Zoom and you will talk to your buddy and you will say, look at this. What do you expect me to do here? What do you think? And he'll go look at it and say, Leave the back wall. Leave the back wall, put a drain in there, and get out of Dodge because you'll be able to talk to him. He'll be able to see it. I actually, my son's a pediatric surgeon. I was in Florida. They had a case they were doing, and he was doing a scoping on a patient. And I'll just tell you this quick, funny story. He had done a stapling of the pylorus in a patient who had trauma, a kid. And he did a gastroenterostomy beyond it, and they could not open up. It didn't open up again. So the kid's a year later and he's still got a stapled pylorus. So I said, he got me on the phone, we're doing FaceTime. I'm looking at the picture on the screen. I said, put the scope in, go backwards to the back of the pylorus, take a needle knife and puncture into the stomach and balloon dilated. We did it and it worked. And it was all done via FaceTime. So I think things are getting better. So thank you all very much for the opportunity.